All right, in this section, I just want to quickly review how to talk or describe mathematically the power and bandwidth of signals, which will let us understand um, the basics of antennas and propagation. So first, let's talk about what are signals. And in if you take a signals and systems class, a signal is just really any quantity that varies in time, and that could be continuous or discrete or complex or real. But for communications, or specifically wireless communications, what we're usually interested in are signals that are information bearing. So for example, what we might have is some transmit signal that carries information, and it will then be modulated through an antenna to create electromagnetic radiation. And both of these are signals in different forms, both the original information signal and the way that we could represent the um, time varying electromagnetic field. Now, what I just want to quickly review here are three characteristics of signals that will be important, which are the power, the bandwidth, and its center frequency. So first, let's talk about energy and power. And let's consider any scalar valued continuous signal, x of t. And remember that in signals and systems, we always think about the magnitude squared of that signal as representing its instantaneous power. Now, the reason why we consider that is in many of the signals of interest, the magnitude squared will be proportional to the actual power. So for example, if it's the voltage x of t, remember that the instantaneous power is the voltage squared over the resistance. Or if it's an EM plane wave, we saw that the power flux is proportional to the electromagnetic field squared um, divided by the characteristic impedance of the medium. All right, now once you have the power, remember power is energy per time. So if we integrate that signal, that would be the total energy over all time, or you could integrate that over some period, and then that would be the energy in that time. And it's called an energy signal, remember, if the total energy is finite. And of course, the power of a signal in some uh, average power over some time would just be you take the integral or the energy in some interval of divided by t and divide it by t and then typically you take the limit as t approaches infinity. Now in wireless communications you typically um, think about power and energy in dB scale instead of linear scale. So let me to understand that just let me quickly review this again this is something hopefully you saw in your undergraduate digital communications class but if you just need a quick refresher here it is um, when we think about linear scale units for power that is typically what you think of power measured in watts or milliwatts like in any undergraduate physics class and um, when we when wireless engineers see watts or million watts they call that in linear scale and of course energy would be in joules or millijoules a joule being one watt over one second but wireless engineers prefer to think about these things in db scale so what you might see is the power in what's called dbw which is the power in watts divided by one watt and then you take this 10 log 10, or dBm, which is the power in milliwatts, or similarly dBmj, which would be the energy divided by one millijoule. Now, the reason why you do this is because, as we'll see, wireless signals have a very large range of possible values, and carrying around the exponents necessary in linear scale becomes kind of unwieldy. So dB scale is a lot easier to handle. Now, just as a quick example, suppose that your power in linear scale is about 250 milliwatts. That's about the maximum transmit power of your typical um, cell phone, if you have one, which I'm sure you do. And you wanted to write, say that in dBW, you just take 0.25, right, because that is uh, 0.25 watts divided by one watt and take this logarithm and you'll get minus six when you work it out. Or if you want it in dBm, 
it's 250 divided by 1, and you take that, and it's 24. Now, I uh, didn't actually use a calculator for this, and you can do both of these calculations um, very quickly um, in your head for a few special values. It's good to be able to do this just so uh, you don't always have to rely on MATLAB or a calculator, and just some quick tricks. Again, hopefully you saw this in your undergrad, uh, undergrad uh, digital comm class, but here it is. So some quick um, useful conversions are that if you have 2, 3, or 10 in linear scale, they correspond to 3 and about 5 and 10 in dB scale. And now you can cascade these like this. Suppose I want to ask you what is 50 milliwatts in dBm? Well, you could use a calculator. It's just 10 log base 10, 50. But I'll show you a quick trick. You write 50 as 10 squared divided by 2. But then you use the law of logarithms, and that is 2 times whatever um, 10 is in dB scale, which is 10, and divided by or minus um, whatever 2, the minus because this is on the denominator here, and that's 3. So it will be 20 minus 3 or 17 dBm. And you don't even have to use your calculator. All right, so that's somewhat useful. The other thing I said, well, I said that one reason why wireless engineers prefer dB scale is because of the large range. But another thing about it is when looking at the progression of power through systems. So suppose we have a transmitter, and it transmits to some power, PTX, and it goes through some device. This could be a channel, but it could be anything. And it has a power gain of G, and you get a received power. So in linear scale, we know that the received power will be G times the transmit power. And in just so we're all clear about the units, the transmit and received power would be watts or milliwatts. And G, because it's a ratio of two powers, would be dimensionless. And G greater than 1 would be some amplification of power, like a power amplifier. And G less than 1 would be some loss, like the loss we'll see propagating through free space, propagating through antennas, or other passive devices that have some loss associated with them. But because of the large range of signals, wireless engineers often do the calculations in dB scale. And because if you take the log of both sides, and the log of a product returns into an um, addition, you will get the gain is just an addition. So the received power in dBW or dBm will be the transmit power plus the gain, but plus in this case. And in this case, the gain is in dB. And a gain greater than or, or less than zero will correspond to the gain or the loss. All right. Um, just think about the, I want to also give you an idea of the kind of typical transmit powers. Now, the one thing about wireless communications, it's used in so many different fields. Transmit powers vary a lot depending on the application. So I've just taken a couple of, uh, some number, set of numbers. And if you take at the very high extreme, if you go back to an old FM radio station, which maybe had to broadcast over, say, 50 kilometer radius, it could transmit in the hundreds of kilowatts of power. All right. Um, a microwave oven is also pretty high. It's about one kilowatt, but don't worry. That is usually enclosed in the microwave oven, so it won't cause any damage. Um, geostationary satellites uh, could transmit also very high power, about 300 watts. But your cell phone, for example, is much lower. It's about, well, as I said, to give you that example, only about a quarter of a watt. So it's a very small amount of power. If you take a look at a Wi-Fi access point that you might have in a uh, office building or at home. It's about, uh, about maybe 200 milliwatts and it keeps on going down. There's also a whole bunch of research interest and maybe that's also some of the applications that you're interested in uh, with this course. Super low power devices which can transmit down to even one and four milliwatts like Bluetooth. There's in fact a whole uh, body of research looking at even much lower powers and uh, maybe we'll get some time to talk about that in this class. All right, let's just make sure we can do some really simple calculations. Uh, let's say I have a transmit power. It's about 17 dBm, a little more than you would typically get on a Wi-Fi laptop. 
and the path loss is about 80 dB. That's not much path loss uh, by wireless standards, by the way. We'll see that shortly. And I ask you, what is the receive power in dBm and milliwatts? Well, that's super easy. We just, you know, um, for dB scale, well, I just take the transmit power in dB minus the path loss. So 17 dBm minus 80, and that will give you minus 63 dBm. The only thing you have to, only thing a student could possibly screw up here is just making sure that that is dBm, just getting the right units. And if I wanted to write it in linear scale, I could just go 10 to the power of six, minus 6.3, but I can just use my little conversion tricks. Minus 63 is minus 60 minus 3. And the minus 60 will correspond to 10 to the minus 6. And the minus 3 will correspond to 0.5. So it's 0.5 times 10 to the minus 6 milliwatts, or equivalently about half a nanowatt. This is actually a relatively strong signal by um, wireless standards for receiving, we're going to see we can receive signals even much lower power than that. So just tiny, tiny fractions of watts can be actually detected. Now, um, what's the energy received in about four microseconds? That, by the way, is the time for one symbol period of a wireless 802.11G system, which you might have also seen in your digital comm class. So that's easy. In linear scale, um, the received energy will be the power times the time. So we just multiply these two numbers and we get this tiny fraction of a millijoule. And we can easily convert that. Again, we don't have to uh, use a calculator if we don't want to, because the 10 to the minus 12 will correspond to minus 120, the 2 will correspond to 3, and we get minus 117. And just remember the units, dB millijoules. We could also have uh, directly got it that energy without ever having gone to linear scale. I would have done that just at the energy in dB scale would be the received power plus the logarithm of the time because it would have multiplied in linear scale. So it's the transmit power minus the path loss plus the logarithm of the time. And the logarithm of the time is um, 4 times 10 to the minus 6. So the minus 6 is the minus 60. The 4 corresponds to the 6, and I get the same number. All right, pretty easy. Uh, I'll give you a little practice problem at the end. Other thing I want to quickly talk about is bandwidth and carrier frequency. So the key idea for wireless engineers, something called power spectral density, and that is the um, measurement of the power per unit frequency. So if this doesn't sound familiar to you, I'm sure it sounds familiar to you, want a quick review again, just go back into the digital com uh, class. And it really tells you the range of frequencies over which that EM wave is occupied. It's typically measured by a spectrum analyzer. And I've just shown a picture of one here. So in this case, it's showing that in this case, uh, the signal is occupied, the X axis here is frequency, and it's showing the power. Now, remember that in a um, wireless passband signal, it, uh, that's after it's modulated up to the carrier, it will usually in, it will be a real valued signal. So it will have a center at the carrier frequency, and the bandwidth here is W, and then it will be an image at minus FC. Of course, the complex baseband signal would be different. It would be centered around zero. All right. Let's do a quick calculation to make sure you know this. Suppose, again, our same uh, signal from before minus, uh, transmits at 17 dBm and has 80 dB of path loss. And let's say the bandwidth is 16.25 um, megahertz. And I'll assume that is transmitted uniformly over the bandwidth. This 16.25 megahertz, by the way, is actually the bandwidth, the occupied bandwidth for the eight a typical 802.11 uh, G Wi-Fi signal. All right, and I ask you, what is the received power in just five megahertz? Well, I could do it like this. The power spectral density, that is the power per unit um, bandwidth, is the received power divided by the bandwidth, total bandwidth, and that's the 16.25. So if I looked at the power in W naught, I would just get the power spectral density times W naught, and that 
gives me this expression here. So I could do this all in linear scale, but again, because I got the values in dB, it's easier to do this in dB scale. And in dB scale, well, this um, multiplication by this ratio will can be converted to a 10 log 10 factor like this. And I will get the uh, received power is the transmit power minus the path loss plus this factor, and this 17 minus 80 divided plus this ratio. And you can, this one you have to put into a calculator, and you get minus 68.1 dB. Now, what is the importance of bandwidth? Generally, data scales linearly in bandwidth. That's actually, it scales as long as the power spectral density remains constant. So if you can increase the power with the bandwidth, the total communication rate will increase. So if I can increase the bandwidth by and power by a factor of n, the communication rate will increase by a factor n. And we'll talk about this in detail later. So just let's compare a old, old 2G system. You're cell phone part maybe not even support 2G anymore, and an LTE system, 4G. So the channel bandwidth of an old LTE system was about 200 kilohertz, and a single uh, channel at the maximum bandwidth of uh, LTE was 20 megahertz. So that is a hundred times bigger. So if the power can scale sufficiently, LTE would have a hundred times the data rate. So that is the reason for trying to get as wide data rate as uh, possible. In fact, LTE has actually much more bandwidth than uh, even this because there's a number of other improvements. And we're going to talk to some of these improvements in this class. Now, just to give you even going up to sort of uh, more recent than LTE is the 802.11 AD system. This is a system operating in the millimeter wave bands up into the 60 gigahertz range, right? And they have the channels are actually um, more than two gigahertz of bandwidth, another factor of 10 greater than what you're, another factor of 100 actually, sorry, greater than an LTE or Wi-Fi uh, system at lower frequencies. So people are looking for larger and larger bandwidths, or you have to get larger and larger bandwidths if you want to transmit more data. And that, with that, I kind of wanted to show you this picture. This is a very nice uh, little graphic taken from the Britannica website. It kind of gives you a catalog, if you like, in terms of frequency of where all sorts of different wireless communication systems sit. So if you look at your cell phone now, most of the cell phones in 3G, 4G systems, and also your commercial Wi-Fi devices typically are in about the one to three gigahertz um, range. But you also see older radio television probably don't receive television that way now, or maybe you've seen an older AM radio, they're at lower frequencies. And even old, very old maritime systems at much lower. And satellite and radio astronomy systems up at higher frequencies. Now, one thing about this, the reason why you might want to go to higher bandwidth is because the higher the carrier frequency, the more the available bandwidth. Typically, the available bandwidth scales proportionally with the carrier frequency. And so if the higher you go up, the more the bandwidth you get. Now, one thing we're going to talk about a little bit in this uh, unit, but also more in the next unit, there's a price to pay, which is that the signals don't propagate as far, especially when you consider obstacles. We're also going to talk about ways to try to extend the range of these very high bandwidth signals in this class, particularly things like directive antennas. But there's some basic uh, physics that we will not be able to overcome. On the other hand, if you go to lower frequencies, they have much less bandwidth, but they have the benefit of having greater range. So this is something that's going to, we're going to see a little bit in this unit and even uh, throughout this whole class. Now. That last slide brings me to a very important topic, which is the millimeter wave bands and 5G. And maybe this is these developments in 5G is what motivated you to take this class. So the um, millimeter wave bands correspond to the bandwidths from 30 to 300 gigahertz. Now, most of the 4G and Wi-Fi systems, as I said before, are in a relatively small bandwidth below 3 gigahertz. And these bandwidths have become very expensive to find available spectrum. Just to give you an example, um, the, there was an auction 
of uh, Spectrum a couple of years ago in the AWS 3 band for about 65 megahertz of bandwidth. And in the U.S., that um, bandwidth, national coverage, sold for about $50 billion. So that Spectrum is very, very expensive. On the other hand, the millimeter bands are relatively unused and relatively cheaper. And you can get conjectured, it's not fully utilized right now, but maybe something in the order of 100 times more bandwidth than there is available in these lower bands. There's been a lot of progress at these uh, frequencies, and we've just seen uh, new 5G systems getting opened up, the 28 and 38 gigahertz range. We're going to use some of these examples in the class to show you some of the problems and difficulties with these bands, but also some of their potential. All right. Now that you've uh, got a little bit of ideas of just power, before going on, I want you to go to the GitHub site, and there you'll find the in-class exercises, and try to do this very, very simple problem. It's just like literally five lines of code. We'll be able to just calculate the energy on some 4G signal. Should be really, really easy. Um, and once you do it, go ahead to the next unit.